You know, I hope the time has arrived in your life where you're just absolutely fed up with the devil. I mean that. I hope that you have hit the point where you're not afraid of the devil, but you're fed up with the devil. The things he's done to you, the things he's done to your family, what he's done to this nation, how he's wreaked havoc in the church, and now the church is in some places cooperating with the agenda of the devil himself. And so I, I, I really want to tell you the desire and the destiny of Satan in this message of Truth Shots. Today, we're going to talk about the desire of Satan going back into ancient times, and we're going to talk about the destiny of Satan going into future times. And so I want you to join me because on today's episode of Truth Shots, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter number 14, and I want to tell you and expose the enemy in this message I've called The Desire and the Destiny of Satan. In that Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy, we're going to be in chapter 14, verse number 12. This is a prophetic, symbolic passage, which almost all scholarship agrees is pointing towards not some human king, but pointing towards the devil himself, Satan, Lucifer, that dragon who is the opposition, the foe of God Almighty. And so let's read together, and I'm going to do something that I love to do, and the devil hates it when we do this. I'm going to expose him for what he is and what's coming his way. And so today, this is our opportunity to listen to the Lord and be reminded that the devil is a defeated enemy. He is a defeated foe, and you and I can take great encouragement from that. In Isaiah 14, 12, this is what it says of the devil. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. And that's a reference to Lucifer. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the amount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to shale, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each one in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch, clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. Now I'm going to leave off reading right there. And I'm going to have a good time today, and I hope you'll get in here right with me, because today I'm going to encourage myself, I'm going to encourage all of you that are watching and listening, that we are opposed by an enemy whose destiny and doom is already written. It's already spelled out. It's already an unavoidable prophetic destiny that Satan and every one of his demons have. And what is coming to them is decreed by God who cannot lie. And we don't need to wait until we get to heaven before we start walking in victory, spiritual victory, as we recognize that the enemy cannot do anything to us unless we let him into our lives. And if we are not going to let him into his life, into our lives, which I, I hope that's your heart posture, not to cooperate with the devil, not to live in any way that is an open door for him to have activity in our lives. Well, if you're living in that way, then you ought to operate with absolute full confidence that you are triumphant over the devil and every single one of his demons that attack you, that attack your family, that attack your finances, that attack your health, that attack your, your church, that attack your ministry, that attack anything that belongs to you through the blood of Jesus. You can come against the enemy with 100% confidence that God is for you and God has defeated him. Now, listen, I get excited about this stuff because when I start preaching and teaching this stuff, something comes alive in the listener's heart and he or she will start recognizing I've been living in defeat. I've been living in fear. I've been worried about the devil. I've been giving the devil credit for stuff that's going on in my life instead of fighting the devil by faith, by the word of the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus and the authority of Christ's kingdom. I've, I've been a victim when I'm actually a victor. 
And so I get really excited about this. And so I want to go through these verses in Isaiah 14 that I've just read to you. And I want to illustrate to you from the word just how defeated the enemy is. And you need to be prepared for all sorts of um, distraction, interruption, things that are going to try to keep you out of this word I'm about to bring because the enemy does not want you to receive this. He does not want you to get a hold of this because he knows it's true. And he knows that Christians that get a hold of these truths and start living them out, they're actually uh, become a danger to his agenda, a danger to his plan and schemes and strategies. So let's get into the word of God without any further ado. And I'm going to give you, first of all, in Isaiah 14, 12, and then a passage in Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a little history on Lucifer, on Satan. Lucifer, his original name is specified in the King James Version in Isaiah 14, 12. And we know him as Satan. Lucifer means the bright one or the morning star. And originally, Lucifer was a good created holy angel of God who worshipped the Lord in eternity past before the creation of man. So he started out as a good angel, but then when he rebelled as we'll talk about, he became known as Satan, which is the accuser and the adversary. So look at this verse. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Now that is a reference to the eviction of Satan from the heavenly realm. When did this happen? Well, we're going to show you why it happened. We don't know chronologically when it happened. It seems clear to me that it was before the creation of Adam and Eve. So we're going way back into eternity past, but we don't know the exact moment. What we deduce from scripture is that Lucifer was a high ranking angel in the heavenly realm. As a matter of fact, many scholars believe that Lucifer was in charge of heaven's worship services. Now, let me tell you from Ezekiel 28, let me give you a little bit of background about what Lucifer was before he was cast out of heaven. From Ezekiel 28, remember that passage, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, they give us a prehistory description of, of, of Lucifer before the fall. And this is what it says in Ezekiel 28, 14. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud. Verse 17, Ezekiel 28, 17. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your own splendor. I cast you to the ground. That's pretty powerful. So you have this description of, of Lucifer as being a high ranking, glorious, beautiful, created angelic being who walked with authority and walked in privilege there in the heavenly realm prior to the creation of man. But he sinned against God. We're going to talk about what that sin was constituted of here in a moment. But just know this. He sinned against God and God does not share his glory with anyone. And so when Satan started wanting God's glory, God said, we'll have none of that. And he cast him from the heavenly realm down to the created earth, down to this planet that we live on. Satan was banished from heaven, no longer able to go there on his own accord and was uh, incarcerated down here in the earthly realm. And immediately he becomes a foe an enemy, an adversary of God. Now, we also learn this. Do you remember in Revelation chapter number 12, verses 7 through 9, in the book of Revelation, we have a, uh, an account looking back to this moment. Let me read it to you. Revelation 12, 9. 9. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. That's another name for Satan. And the dragon and his angels, those are the demons. Satan, the dragon, and his angels, the demons, fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So there you have it. You have a very 
uh, kind of capsulized expression of how the demonic realm came into, the, uh, came into existence. That Satan took a third of the angels of heaven with him when he rebelled against God and God cast them all out, cast them all down. So now we don't know the exact number, but we know we have Satan, the leader of all of the demonic realm that is existing in planet earth. Isn't that mind blowing? That literally God's word tells you this is how it happened. We all know about demons. We all believe in the demonic realm. We all believe in the supernatural ministry of holy angels and the attack of fallen angels, demonic angels, uh, fallen spirits or evil spirits that are called demons. Well, that's how it happened. It's very clear in scripture that Satan led a rebellion against God. Satan was defeated and he and all that rebelled hit with him, all of those fallen angels were cast down to earth. And now they come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's their assignment. They are so furious that God evicted them. They're so um, insanely enraged that they did not accomplish their mission against God, that now they fight and wage war against everything that God loves. And by the way, what does God love more than the church? We are those that have the elect love of God. We have the salvific love of God. It just means that God loves all people he created, but there is a special covenant love with those who are saved in Jesus Christ. And we are the people that bring God glory. And Satan hates God's glory because he wanted it for himself. And so Satan and his demons wage war against the church. And that means you. That means me. That means everybody under the blood of Jesus is the primary target of hell. And so there is an actual spiritual war going on that has physical and natural ramifications and consequences. Satan is waging war on you because he hates you because you're a glory bearer. That's why a lot of the things that are happening in our lives that are painful, that involve loss and pain and abuse and betrayal and abandonment and sickness and affliction and infirmity and, and all of these things, not all of it is just simple ho-hum, that's life, that's the way things come. No. Much of it comes directly from the attack of the demonic realm on your life and on mine. So let's go a little bit further here. By the way, remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Jesus told his disciples that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Jesus, the son of God, was in the throne room when God the Father cast out Satan. And Jesus' earthly testimony to his disciples, because they came back one day and they're like, oh man, we're casting out the demons. The de demons are subject to us. And Jesus says, hey, don't rejoice in that. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so got all of those verses. I wanted to give you those to give you a good picture of what happened in order for Lucifer, the holy angel, to end up becoming the arch enemy, arch enemy of God Almighty and of the church. So that's his desire coming up right here. Here is his desire. This is what got him evicted from heaven. He had the thirst. It was the thirst of Satan to be the king. Satan wanted the throne. Satan literally did not want God to be God. Satan wanted to be worshiped, adored, and to be empowered as if he were God. But he had a problem because God was God. God still is God. And so I don't know what entered into the heart of Satan besides sin, besides pride, besides self-glory. But when he rebelled against God, here's what it looked like. Here's, here's the, his secret desire for glory was seen in verse number 13 of Isaiah 14. We're back in Isaiah now. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will go to the highest point in the heavenly realm. I will exalt myself. I will elevate myself. I will put myself in the place that is reserved only for God. So immediately we find out that he had pride and presumption. He wanted something that God had not given him. And he wanted something that can only belong to God. What is that? The rule and the authority and the ascension to the throne of God Almighty. Then in verse 13, he, he expresses his deep desire for power. He says, above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly that re and in the far reaches of the north. So the, the picture is, is that Satan was, is saying, I'm going as high as I can go. I'm going as far as I can go. I'm going to set my own throne on high. Now, how many of you know that two kings can't rule in the same kingdom? So for Satan to decree that he would set his throne up in heaven, 
means that he had to dethrone God off of God's throne. And that is the essence of rebellion. Very quickly here, that's still the essence of rebellion. The essence of rebellion is when you or I or other people decide that we're smarter than God, that we're wiser than God, that we have a better plan than God, and we ascend to the place of rule in our lives. We ascend to the throne room. We determine, we become self-determined people that we're going to do this and we're going to do this. Every act of sin is a somewhere a decision that says, I don't care what God says, I want to do what I want to do. Man, that is intense. And that's what got Satan kicked out of heaven. And then ultimately, if verse 13 didn't convince you, verse 14 will. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. There you have it. Satan decreed. And God is like reading the indictment of this in Isaiah 14. He said, I heard what you said. You said, I will make myself like the most high. And God laughs at that. God laughs at any angel, any demon, any human that says that I'm going to be like God. God laughs at that because nobody can contest his authority and succeed. And so when Satan did it, that was the final straw. When God heard from the mouth of Lucifer in the eternity past, in the, in the uh, heavenly and angelic realm, he hears Lucifer say, I want to be God. And God said, that's it. And that's when Jesus says, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. That's when we read that he was cast down out of the heavenly realm, out of the mountain of God. That's the way it's described. The mountain or the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Satan was cast out of it. So let's just pause here for a minute. That gives you some information. Maybe you've never heard it explained that way. I want you to understand something. Satan is the enemy of God Almighty and if you are in Jesus Christ, God Almighty is not merely your God, he's your father. Now, I have two children. They're, they're big and they're grown now. My son's bigger than me. My daughter is an adult. And um, I, I can remember back in times when they were small and little and they really needed daddy in such a way that maybe now they don't need me that much. But the, the memory I have is that if anybody ever sought to bring harm to my children as their father, oh, believe me, I will intervene. I will do whatever it takes to protect my children if anybody dared to come against them. There is nothing I wouldn't do to protect my children from harm from an enemy. Now, I want you to think about that because many of you are parents and grandparents. Wouldn't you feel the same way? If anybody is coming against your kids to hurt them, aren't you going to act? Mama bear, you hear me on this. We all know you don't mess with a mama bear because she might be nice and sweet and just completely calm and chill, but you mess with her kids and boom, the claws are going to come out and she will bring some pain to anybody that messes with her kids. The same thing with a father. Why? It's our instinct to protect our children. So I've got a question for you. Do you think that God's instinct to protect his children is less than your instinct to protect yours? Absolutely not. It's far greater. And here's another element. God knows that Satan comes against you for one reason, because God is your father. Satan hates you simply because God loves you. And so God knows when Satan comes against his own children that Satan is doing that because he is trying to hurt God. He's trying to take something that God loves and so God moves, friends, and when we are in fellowship with the Lord, when we're walking in the light and not in darkness, very important here, I can have the confidence that God will protect me. I can have the confidence that God will defend me. I can have the confidence that God will lead me and bless me and prosper me if I'm walking in the spirit. Now, if I'm living in sin, if I'm compromised, if I'm actually cooperating with the devil by hiding sin in my life or dabbling in sin over here while I dabble in righteousness over here. If I'm double minded, then I'm unstable in all my ways. And I should have no confidence that God will protect me because one of the things God will do is when we cooperate with the devil, the Lord will actually allow us to reap what we sow. What does that mean? It means this. If you really want to dabble in sin, if you want to live a compromised life, if you want to pretend Christianity most of the time and then have your own you know, like little throne on your heart to do whatever you want some of the other time, then you're walking out of fellowship with God. 
and you've actually moved away from the place where his protection comes. See, God protects us in the place of righteousness and obedience and surrender and trust. There's a canopy of protection in that place and God will protect you there. But when you move out from under that, you move out from under the place of blessing and protection. And so God will allow you to wander sometimes. And what the desire of God is, is when you wander and the enemy is on you, it will send you fleeing back to God saying, Father, forgive me. I wandered. I strayed. I sinned. Now, Lord, I repent of that sin and I come back to the place of your blessing, your faithfulness and your protection. I trust you. Restore me now to your good graces. And see, friends, when we walk in that place of obedience, then we can be absolutely protected that we are convinced that we have the Father's protection. You need to know that today. If you, if you feel like you're being attacked, I want you to know that the attack would be far worse if God wasn't protecting you. Sometimes he lets the devil get close because he wants us to grow in strength. He wants us to learn spiritual warfare. He wants us to take the authority that he has given to us as his children. And instead of just saying, God, get the devil, he's after me. God, God will sometimes say, no, my child, you're growing up in the faith. Use the authority. You use the authority that I've given you by virtue of my son. And so that's a great day in your life where, and, and listen, I'm not against ever you praying and saying, God, help me. The devil's after me. But I'm going to tell you, as you're growing, sometimes the Lord says, I'm going to help you. But I actually want the devil to see you, my child, operating in the authority that I've given you. And that's why we're told to submit ourselves unto God, resist the devil. God tells you, you resist the devil. And the Bible says the devil will flee from you. Isn't that amazing? You don't have to be afraid of the devil. You don't want to be presumptuous. You don't be cocky about it, but you need to take the authority that you have in the blood of Jesus and you tell the demons they have no right to you, no right to your family, no right to your property, no right to your health, no right to your finances. You take the authority that your father has given you. And the father delights when he sees us as his children take his authority and we send his enemy running. It's part of your birthright in Jesus Christ. It's part of the power you have and part of the authority you have. Most Christians aren't using it. A lot of Christians say, well, that's just for those charismatics. That's for those fringe people. That's for the people who get distracted. We're just Bible people. Let me tell you, the devil's not intimidated by your Bible study. He's really not. Uh, you don't counsel a demon out of somebody. You have to come with power against their power. You don't have the ability to negotiate with a demon and say, do you mind leaving? Because the demons don't negotiate. They come to kill, steal, and destroy. They're completely sold out for the work of their master, Satan. And so when we come against evil power, we have to come with the holy authority and the power that God's given us. And my friend, you have that. You may not feel that you have that, but you have that. And faith is more than a feeling. And you start using what God has given you by declaring the blood of Jesus over your life, your family, your ministry, your finances, your body, your health. You have to start doing that. And the enemy doesn't have any choice. He has no authority to come up against God's authority through you. It's an amazing story. I wish I had more time to really unpack it, but let me get back to the end of the story because the end of it is this, the elimination of Satan from the story. Let's talk about his destiny, okay? Let's just get happy here at the end of this. Focus right here because you need to know this. We need to go to the back of the story and see what's coming to the devil, what's coming to every single demon. So we're back in Isaiah 14 and verse 15 says this, Satan, you've rebelled. You've exalted yourself up against the most high. You've wanted his throne, but this is what verse 15 says, but you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. This is a prophetic word that looks to the end of the age. Let me give it to you from the book of Revelation and a little bit more. And my friend Josh will put this verse up on the screen. These verses from Revelation 20. When the thousand years are ended, this is the millennial reign of Jesus at the end of the age where he reigns on earth for a thousand years and Satan is incarcerated during that thousand years. Satan will be released from his prison, verse 8, Revelation 28, and he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. He will gather them for battle and their number will be like the sand of the sea. And this is coming. This is going to happen on this planet. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth. They surrounded the camp of the saints, the people of God and the beloved city, Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. 
And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hallelujah. That's the word of God, man, that says this is what's coming to the devil. That the end, I mean, the devil hates Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10, because it's right there. It's written and decreed by a God who cannot lie. The end of the age sees Satan and every one of his demons in the lake of fire. And before that happens, look at verse 16 and 17 of Isaiah 14. Those who see you, that's me and you, at the end of the age, right before Satan's cast into the lake of fire, it says, those who see you will stare at you and will ponder over you. And here's what we'll be questioning. We'll say, is this the one that made the earth to tremble? Who shook the kingdoms? Who made the whole world like a desert and overthrew its cities and wouldn't let his prisoners go home? Do you realize that we'll come back with Jesus, we'll be glorified, we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ, Satan will rebel, and he will be destroyed, and right before he's cast in the lake of fire, me, you, and all of the ages, all the saints of all the ages are going to say, oh my goodness, is this the one we were sometimes afraid of? Is this the one that ruled the world? Look at him now, he is as defeated as he's ever going to be. And here's the amazing part, and I'm going to close right here. Faith says this. Faith says, we believe now what God says will happen then. We believe right now that the devil is defeated. We tell him right now, you are doomed for the lake of fire and I'm destined to share in the glory of God just like you wanted when you rebelled against God. You tried to take the glory of God. I've received by faith the glory of God in my life through the person of Jesus Christ. And we have to say right now, Satan, you're doomed. Demons, you're doomed. In the name of Jesus, leave here. You are doomed and you are damned. So those are my thoughts today as we conclude this episode of Truth Shots. I'm going to tell you, we have it, friends, in an amazing victory. We have Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you right now. He loves you. He died for you. He rose for you. And he's coming again for all of those that trust him. And some of you have compromised and you've strayed, but he's calling you back right now. And he says, I love you and I'll forgive you of everything you've ever done, but you have to bow to me. I'm not telling you pray this little sweet prayer and ask Jesus in your heart. I'm saying, no, at this point in your life, you got to bow to the son of God. You need to repent and bow to the son of God and welcome Jesus Christ to be the Lord over your life. And when you do that, friends, you can walk in all confidence that you are walking with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the devil has nothing that he can do against you. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in to Truth Shots. We'll see you next time.